Our speaker today is Max Wilbert, a writer and biocentric community organizer. He has been of grassroots political work for 20 years and was founder of Protect Thacker Pass. Max is the author of two books, most recently, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. His work has been featured on CNN, The New York Times, NPR, Le Monde, uh, BBC, and elsewhere. With the rapid growth in the energy storage and electric vehicle industries, demand for raw materials like lithium is rising. This is creating new frontiers of resource extraction as lands that were previously uncommodified is now worth billions on the market. This presentation will build on the previous talk by another Bright Green Lies author, Lear Keith, based on a specific case study, the Thacker Pass lithium mine in Northern Nevada. Mr. Wilbert was involved in launching a protest movement called Protect Thacker Pass. And now, Max, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Cloud. I appreciate everyone for taking the time to be here. I wanna also thank uh, Jean, Anitra, and Vic for explaining some more of the history behind the Club of Rome before we started the recording. Um, thanks, Art, Dave, everyone who helped put this together. Uh, you've set me up for some pretty serious disappointment by making me follow after Lear. She's a hard act to follow. So let's jump right in. <clears throat> This is what addiction looks like. We live in a culture that is addicted to energy, addicted to growth, and addicted to the personal automobile. Just one more lane, bro, I promise. We could substitute electric car for lane in this picture, and it would fit exactly. But today we're going to be talking about Thacker Pass. I'm going to talk about what's been happening at Thacker Pass, the history, the geology of the formation of uh, the McDermott caldera that resulted in a high concentration of lithium in the area, why this place is important biologically, culturally, and what is exactly at threat there. So I am not the poet that Lier is, but I am a photographer. And so I want to start this presentation by taking you there. This is the place that's called Pahimaha in the Paiute language, the Northern Paiute language. And this land was formed as it currently exists today in this shape about 16 million years ago when the Yellowstone hotspot, which is the geologic feature that makes the geysers at Yellowstone National Park today, was located under this area, which is on the Nevada-Oregon border, um, <coughs> in basically southeastern Oregon, and north central Nevada, if people are familiar with the geography of the region. So the, uh, the, the Yellowstone hotspot brought all of this volcanic activity to the region. You can see some of these rocks here shaped and compressed under extreme pressures and temperatures. And as a result of that volcanic activity and the erosional processes that took place after, after uh, the hotspot moved on, Lithium was concentrated in the sediments at Thacker Pass at levels that are very, very high. So um, also, I'll, I'll just point out in this photo, those tracks alongside the bottom of the cliff there are cougar tracks. That was a couple of winters ago on the mountainside at Thacker Pass. So this is one of the main forces that made Thacker Pass what it is. Over the, the years, as climate change has occurred, as um, ice ages have come and gone, the situation has changed in this area as well. Many people will be familiar with the fact that the Great Salt Lake is a remnant of much larger inland seas. One of them was called Lake Lahontan that uh, filled this area that's now known as the Great Basin of the American West. Um, the Great Basin is an endorheic basin where all of the rainfall and snow that falls in the region, um, it melts, it drains into the valley bottoms and into these lakes, and then it simply evaporates or, or trickles down into the groundwater. None of it drains out to the ocean, and that's why it's called the Great Basin. So this has led to some really interesting effects on the biology of the region. For example, there are fish species. There's a fish species called the Lahontan cutthroat trout that is, it's a salmonid species. It originally lived in these 
enormous inland seas. And as they receded, they were left isolated in these remnant populations in very small rivers and creeks. Um, many of them, uh, many of the, the <clears throat> waterways in this region, they follow the opposite pattern that most rivers and streams follow. So I live in Oregon, in Western Oregon, it's very wet. And if you start at the top of a stream, it's very small. And if you follow it down to the ocean, it's big, right? There's more and more water getting added to it. In Nevada, you often have the opposite happening. The waterways are their biggest high up in the mountains close to their source, and they get smaller and smaller as they as they drain down, oftentimes disappearing completely, sometimes due to overpumping, sometimes due to just natural seasonal variability in the, the rainfall and so on. So uh, there's very interesting biology and geological history out here. And it has resulted in this incredibly beautiful biodiverse place. Uh, when people think of biodiversity, of uh, the natural world, of the treasure and wonder of the natural world, people often think of the redwoods or the Great Barrier Reef or these ecosystems that are uh, visually stunning at first glance, right? You, you sort of can't ignore the biodiversity and the importance of these places. It's in your face, right? But uh, the Great Basin is much more subtle. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've got some seasonal allergies. <clears throat> One of the keystone species out there is this sagebrush. Um, the Great Basin is also called the sagebrush sea or the sagebrush ocean sometimes. And I like to think of it as an old growth forest that usually gets no taller than about your hip. So these plants can be hundreds of years old and they are part of these very complex, diverse plant communities that feed insects, uh, that support populations of both migratory and resident birds, um, aquatic species, um, all kinds of different animals that rely on these places. <coughs> So this is Thacker Pass. These photos are mostly taken throughout 2021 and 2022. This is before major mining operations began on the site. And what you can see in a picture like this is a largely intact expanse of old growth sagebrush habitat. This is actually a very important habitat um, across the region. It's declining pretty rapidly due to uh, overgrazing, um, direct destruction for various reasons. Uh, fire, increasing fire, followed by invasion from cheatgrass and other non-native species. Um, <clears throat> and the effects of global warming and drought in this region have made um, the sagebrush recruitment, the ability of babies to survive and grow up into new sagebrush plants, uh, very low. So we're seeing a big ecological shift happening across the entire Great Basin where sagebrush communities are dying out. This is an overview of uh, much of Thacker Pass, looking down on it from above. And you can see just this twisted, gnarled old sagebrush. This, is, this, this uh, sagebrush could easily be 200 years old. And uh, most people might not see it as, uh, as, as what it is, a very valuable ancient member of a biotic community that's stabilizing the entire ecology of the area, that's sequestering carbon, that's providing habitat, oxygen. Um, all of these so-called ecosystem services just by living, just by living. Many people look out at Thacker Pass and they describe it as a wasteland. They describe it as a desert. And in my conversations in the region <laughs> with native people, Northern Paiute, Western Shoshone people from the area, one of the messages I often heard was people see this place as a wasteland but we look out on this land and we see everything we need to survive. So there are food plants and animals here. There are medicinal plants and substances. There's water. There's the material that's needed for clothing, for, uh, for food, for survival, for raising children. And uh, a lot of people don't see that. This is Thacker Pass in the spring. You've probably seen in a few of these pictures, there are a few disturbed areas. There are a few roads that existed throughout Thacker Pass before uh, when these pictures were being taken in 2021 and 2022, but it was largely intact, not a pristine landscape, but largely intact. 
uh, some of the wildlife of Thacker Pass. These are some bobcat tracks in the snow. Um, shorebirds nesting in some of these seasonal wetlands in the area. I didn't know actually that these killdeer have that orange ring around their eyes until I took this photo and zoomed in and, and realized how stunning that was. <coughs> And baby horn larks. Pocket gopher. Rodents are very important in the desert. A lot of the region out here, it's actually sagebrush steppe, not desert technically. A lot of the life out here is nocturnal or diurnal, and a lot of it lives underground uh, because the temperatures and the weather can be quite extreme. This is a ferruginous hawk, the largest uh, of the soaring hawks. Pronghorn antelope, North America's fastest land animal. Uh, the only antelope species in in on the continent, the second fastest animal on the planet after the cheetah. Historical numbers of the pronghorn were about 60 million, and there are about 1 million left. The mine would destroy a couple of important migratory corridors for a pronghorn. Mule deer in the early morning in the spring. And these are sage grouse. This is an iconic species of the American West. They're a large chicken-like bird, mostly ground, uh, ground-dwelling bird. They can fly, but they don't fly very much often. Um, the females are very inconspicuous. There's actually at least one of them in the picture on the right, but you can't you can barely see her towards the center left of that picture. The two males have the big white ruff, and uh, and they they go to these breeding sites in the spring and they dance this dance at sunrise where the males are making this just incredible sound and the females come flying in from all directions. Um, sage grouse have declined by 80% since 1965 and nearly 40% since 2002. That's on top of previous population collapses. The population was 16 million a century ago, that's the estimate. And now it's closer to 200,000. So that's a 99% a decline. And this region, the Northwestern Great Basin has been particularly hard hit. <laughs> Some more of the wildlife in the region, jackrabbits, rattlesnakes, porcupines, Western fence lizards. Interesting fact about them, when ticks that are carrying Lyme disease bite the Western fence lizard, they contain some sort of antibody in their blood that actually cures the tick of Lyme disease. So in areas where there are Western fence lizards, its incidence of Lyme is much lower. Um, and I believe this is some type of alligator lizard, although I'm not sure. Insect life, very abundant out in this area. Some more cougar tracks up on the mountainside. And you can just get a sense for a wild place, a place where the night skies are incredibly bright, where the land is quiet, the loudest sounds are often coyotes howling, buzzing insects, and the sound of the wind in your ears. It's a place where uh, the natural forces have dominated since, since the place was created. Um, it's a place where, you know, the sunrises and sunsets just create this magical light on the landscape. And, you know, lest you get distracted by all these beautiful wildlife photos, the majestic scenery, let me remind you, <laughs> as Lithium Nevada would tell us, that destroying this landscape is actually clean, green, and sustainable. And I quote from their ESG report, environmental leadership is a core value of Lithium Americas. We recognize that the success of our operations must be underpinned by our commitment to responsible and sustainable business practices. We do this by responsibly managing our impacts in the regions and communities where we operate. Thacker Pass is designed and engineered to minimize its environmental footprint, to avoid sensitive habitat, and to employ the best available environmental control technologies. They just tried to say the word responsible as many times as they could in that sentence, in that paragraph. So let's look at what it actually looks like. This is drone video that was taken uh, a few weeks ago. It was sent to me anonymously. And this is Thacker Pass now. 
uh, the construction of the mine has begin has begun. So what you're seeing here is biotic cleansing. They're destroying all the life in Thacker Pass down to the microorganisms in the soil. So all of that biodiverse old growth sagebrush has been destroyed. All the creatures have been killed or driven away. The burrowing owls, the sage grouse, the hunting grounds for the bobcats and the cougars, the home for the migratory birds, the migration corridors. This is just the beginning. Construction is going to be ongoing for at least three years out there, at which point pretty much everything that you can see in this image will be destroyed. Um, the mine itself is going to be uh, about 400 feet deep, which is the height of a 30-story building across almost 6,000 acres. Future expansions of the mine could triple that size. This is one of six trucks that were delivered to Thacker Pass a few weeks ago. It's a Komatsu Mining HD 785-8, um, and it has a 350-gallon or 1,300-liter fuel tank. So that's sustainability in action. A few statistics about the Thacker Pass mine. Um, <clears throat> the open pit, which you can see on the left-hand side of this map here, would be about a half a mile across and 2.3 miles long. I don't have the easy conversion to kilometers, but y'all probably can do it better than I can. The mine would burn around 11,000 gallons, roughly 45,000 liters of diesel fuel per day for on-site operations and about as much for off-site operations as well. The CO2 equivalent emissions from the mine would add up to more than 150,000 tons per year. Uh, that's the emissions of a small city and roughly 2.3 tons per every ton of lithium that would be produced. And the amount of lithium that's in the soil is about 2,000 to 9,000 parts per million, which means producing one ton of lithium will require strip mining and processing between 110 and 500 tons of the earth, of what was once a mountainside, what was once habitat. A few more statistics here that I think are important. According to the environmental impact statement, the mine would use, <coughs> excuse me, would uh, use 5,800 tons of sulfuric acid per day for the refining process. That would mean they'd have to truck in 700,000 tons of sulfur per year, which is equivalent to the mass of two Empire State Buildings per year, every year for almost 50 years of mine operation. And this mine could easily be extended to last for 100 years or more. Um, just so people are clear, the main source of industrial sulfur used in these types of um, technologies in the creation of, of sulfuric acid is oil and gas refineries. That's where almost all of it comes from. And as you folks being Canadians are very well aware, the tar sands are a very high sulfur uh, fuel. And actually the economics of selling the sulfur that is removed from tar sands crude is uh, is pretty important to the economics of the Alberta tar sands in general. So this is a sulfur pile. This is the port of Vancouver, BC. That's some of the material they're looking at. And this is how lithium fits into the bigger picture. Extraction and primary processing of metals and other minerals is responsible for 20% of health impacts from air pollution and 26% of global carbon emissions. The biggest surprise to the authors of the study in question was the huge climate impact. All sectors combined of extraction accounted for 53% of the world's carbon emissions before accounting for fuel that is burned. So mining is bad for the planet. <laughs> Big surprise, right? Anyone who's paying attention knows this. Anyone who spent any time around a mine knows this. And Last but not least, this is what is coming to the American West. This is 113 planned, proposed, or exploratory lithium projects in the Western United States, most of them in the state of Nevada, but also California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota. <laughs> There's a gold rush going on right now, not just for lithium, but all sorts of rare earth minerals and other materials 
that are increasingly in demand for so-called green technologies. And the question is, is it worth it? Is it worth it to do this? Is it worth it to destroy places like Thacker Pass? This is a cloverleaf interchange. This is what Lewis Mumford called our national flower. So the question, is it worth it? This is a comparison of greenhouse gas emissions between EVs and gasoline powered cars. Uh, there's a lot of different numbers out there. There's, uh, you can find quite a range of uh, results when you look at this type of comparison, but broadly speaking, they show something similar. When you power um, EVs with just coal or fossil fuels, they have a pretty high impact in terms of greenhouse gases. When you power them with the current mixture of fuels, maybe you're looking at 40% uh, of the emissions of a gas-powered car, an equivalent gas-powered car. And if you power it with completely renewable power, you're looking at something significantly lower. <clears throat> this image right here on the right, this uh, bar graph, is not completely accurate because it doesn't account for uh, the production-related emissions of electric vehicles. It's talking about just in use. So lifetime emissions, this is another source. Again, you can find a lot of different numbers out there. I'm not trying to say this source is definitive, but I think it's important to point this out. With 100% renewable electricity, this source says that an electric car will produce between 14 and 21 metric tons of carbon emissions over its life cycle. That's a lot of carbon emissions. And that's very important for people to understand. Electric cars require a lot of uh, minerals, we should say different minerals, compared to uh, conventional internal combustion engine vehicles. This uh, graph right here is from the International Energy Agency. It doesn't include steel, which is by far the bulk of the uh, minerals that are used in a car. Um, but it does include copper, lithium, nickel, these other materials that are listed along the bottom here in a very small font that you probably can't read. <laughs> but it shows that the demands for these other types of minerals are much higher in an electric car compared to an internal combustion engine car. So is this a false hope? Are electric vehicles taking us in the wrong direction? I believe they are. And I believe they are because even if our culture, our society, our world switches completely to electric vehicles, those electric vehicles will be embedded in the economy as it currently exists, a largely similar economy. You may achieve substantially larger, uh, lower carbon emissions, but they're not going to be uh, enough. That reduction is not going to be enough to avoid the catastrophic consequences of climate change, let alone uh, the fact that switching to electric vehicles does not do anything to address the broader biodiversity crisis, which is largely not driven by global warming at this point. It's largely driven by habitat destruction and other forms of, of, uh, of direct harm to biodiversity, overhunting, and so on. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about this slide because Lear covered this topic in detail, and we wrote a whole book about why green technologies like wind, solar, electric vehicles, and so on are not actually good for the planet. Now, if you're in this group uh, you're probably here because you understand that growth is a major problem, that our society has been on this path of exponential growth in population, in energy consumption, in resource consumption, and that this cannot continue on a finite planet, that we are running up against ecological limits. And when that happens, um, many people will say that our society will not change. Well, the laws of physics will not change. The laws of ecology will not change. And so we are coming to the point where those laws are asserting themselves more and more. And this is exactly what was predicted in the Limits to Growth study 50 years ago, and we're seeing it playing out uh, almost exactly as those predictions were made. <clears throat> so this is a chart that I made probably almost 10 years ago 
trying to compare fossil fuels and so-called green technologies in terms of extraction, production, pollution, et cetera. And if you look closely, you'll see that it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, this, is a, this is a qualitative description, of course. The difference is one word. Under pollution, the last sentence, under fossil fuels, it says pollution often visible at site of consumption. And under green technology, it says pollution often invisible at site of consumption. That to me is the only significant difference between fossil fuels and green technologies. Um, I say that as someone who is extremely concerned about global warming. Uh, I was lucky enough to participate in 2010 in a climate science expedition to the Russian Arctic, where I helped document uh, science that was being done up there on methane emissions from lakes, thawing permafrost, uh, subsea permafrost. And uh, so I've stood on the thawing Arctic. I have walked through forests up there that are falling over as the permafrost is thawing and seen these ancient mammoth bones eroding out of hillsides that are collapsing due to uh, these extreme temperatures. 2010 was the warmest summer on record in that region. And global warming is absolutely terrifying. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a massive crisis. So I make this comparison not to push people to stay with fossil fuels, but to help people recognize that green technologies are not significantly different from fossil fuels when it comes to their impact on the planet. So what do we do about this? Um, I started writing Bright Green Lies around 2015, and my research led me to learn about Thacker Pass for the first time. I visited it in 2020, and I fell in love with the place. Uh, this is a feather from a prairie falcon, which is the desert variant of the peregrine falcon. And when I woke up my first morning at Thacker Pass, this feather, I slept out on the ground in my sleeping bag beautiful October evening. And this feather was a few feet away from me when I woke up. I actually wrote about the experience I had that morning in an article that I published in Earth Island Journal in 2021. And the feeling that I had was that this land was giving me a, a, a task to help defend it. And I felt that if I didn't fight to defend this place, then no one will. Because the mainstream environmental organizations have lined up behind this idea that renewable energy technologies and electric vehicles are going to save the planet, despite overwhelming evidence, in my opinion, that these technologies are themselves significantly destructive to the earth, that they may reduce carbon emissions, but that ignores completely the fact of the destruction that is required for their production, their maintenance, their disposal, and so on. And to me, this is why the environmental movement has lost its way. This is where the subtitle for Bright Green Lies came from, because our movement, which was once about prairie falcons and sagebrush, forests and soils and rivers and oceans, has now become about industrial technology. It has become about solving for the wrong variable, as we say in the book. Industrial civilization is not the thing that we must save. Industrial civilization is fated to fall. As Lier said in her presentation, the end was written into the beginning. What has to be saved is the planet. We can live without industrial electricity. We can live without cars. We can live without the internet. We can live without cell phones. We can even live without modern medicine. At least some of us can. But the planet cannot survive with industrial civilization continuing. And the planet is going to shake off this civilization. That's what we are seeing. I saw Dr. Bill Reese in the audience. His work has shown that if you look at physicists like uh, Tim Garrett at the University of Utah, the data is out there and it has been very clear for 50 years, if not far longer. This way of life will not continue. The question is, are we going to make the choices to defend the land or are we going to double down on technologies that will only further destroy the land to briefly extend the lifespan of industrial civilization? 
so that we can enjoy the comforts and elegancies of modern civilization for a little bit longer. So we set up camp at Thacker Pass in January of 2021. It was exceptionally cold. We set up a small tent, started staying out there 24 seven, writing and speaking to the media, trying to spread the word about this greenwashing, uh, about why Thacker Pass is important, trying to raise the alarm about these issues. We were lucky enough to start networking with people from the local communities, including the indigenous peoples from the area who told us of the, their long sacred history and relationship with that place. And we started organizing in many different ways. Um, my friend Will Falk is an attorney and he's currently representing two tribes in federal court cases, trying to stop the mine. As you saw, the construction has already begun. And as many of you probably know, the legal system in Canada, just like in the United States, is set up to facilitate resource extraction. The United States was founded as a colonial enterprise built on resource extraction. It was literally founded by corporations who came to this continent to extract wealth. And that has continued. That's enshrined in our legal system. So it's no surprise to me that um, the court cases have been unfortunately unsuccessful in these cases. This is a nonviolent direct action that we took part in back in April. This is an elder named Dean Barlis, spiritual leader from the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, who led prayers in the area and helped block construction of the mining equipment. Um, this is a teepee that was set up in early May of this year at what we called the Oxam Newe Momokane Nakudun, which is, I'm probably butchering the, present, the pronunciation, but... Um, I don't speak Paiute. Um, that means uh, the indigenous women's camp. And uh, this resistance camp was set up on the water pipeline route, the, the construction of the water pipeline for the mine, and was in place for about a month before it was raided by police and dismantled. I'm currently uh, facing a $50,000 fine from the Bureau of Land Management and have been sued by the mining company along with uh, a group of other people for um, these actions. So we're currently fighting this out. So humans can live in a way that makes the planet more biodiverse and more stable and more alive. It's very challenging. It's not something that you see in the world today, but it's the way that all of our ancestors lived throughout history. Um, as again, I'm quoting Lier throughout this presentation because she's a brilliant speaker and writer. As she often says, it's never been about people versus the planet. It's always been people plus the planet. But in order for that to be true, we have to take action. Um, this has to be a political movement. So just to give people some of our uh, sense of our strategy at Thacker Pass, this was what we were trying to do. These were some of the, the, uh, the goals and strategies that we were attempting to use. We know we're in an ecological crisis. We know that this is a global issue. This is much bigger than just Thacker Pass. This is much bigger than just lithium mining or electric vehicles. This is much bigger than just global warming. This is a time of converging ecological crisis. And that is why I believe that we need to start thinking like a resistance movement. Um, a couple of terms that I will throw out there that might be useful to people. This was useful to me when I began to think about these things is three different types of actions that we could take. Shaping actions, sustaining actions, and decisive actions. Shaping includes things like education. It's creating the conditions for eventual victory. Sustaining is keeping the movement going. What can we do to sustain what we're doing, to stay organized, to give us what we need to continue, whether that's material resources, whether it's um, you know <laughs> the emotional support that we need, whether it's organizing help. And the most important is decisive action, decisive action which directly achieves what we're trying to do. This can happen in a lot of different ways. And... As we are living in a time of these converging crises, we have seen 
that reform, legislative change, public education, all these popular strategies to address the ecological crisis have proven inadequate. We wouldn't be in a crisis as we are now if those strategies were adequate. We've had a modern environmental movement for more than 50 years, and everything is far worse than it was 50 years ago. That doesn't mean those methods are worthless, but they are obviously inadequate. And this is why I'm a revolutionary. I gave this talk to a group of Marxists years ago. I'm not a Marxist myself, but what I told them was, you know, Marxists are all about seizing the means of production, right? And, and redistributing wealth among the people. So they want to seize the factories and the machinery and so on. I told them those things are actually the problem. <laughs> These are the tools that are being used to vastly accelerate the destruction of the planet. So I told them we not need to not just seize the means of production and socialize it or nationalize it. We need to actually dismantle and destroy much of the means of production. It's possible to destroy the planet just as fast or faster under socialism as it is under capitalism. And this is why I think the industrial infrastructure that is destroying the planet cannot be allowed to continue to function. This is one piece of the puzzle. This image here is from the book, Deep Green Resistance Strategy to Save the Planet. And it shows a range of actions, a taxonomy of action, so to speak. Many of you are scientists and may appreciate that. I think we need to stop thinking like consumers when like people who are documenting the problems that we're facing. And we need to start thinking like a resistance movement. And I believe we need a two-pronged movement we need an above ground wing that's working for all those types of things that people have been working for for so long. Ecosystem restoration, building alternative communities, local food systems, localized governments, direct democracy, um, mass movements for, uh, for justice and so on. And a confrontational or underground revolutionary wing that is focused on decisive action to dismantle the industrial infrastructure that is really accelerating the destruction of the planet. And I think that will have to be by any means necessary. Uh, I don't say that lightly. I don't say that with any glee or happiness. I think we're in a very, very, very bad situation. And if any people know the difficulties in shifting the trajectory of a civilization like this, it's the people on this call who've been raising the alarm for half a century and everything has only accelerated. Um, as, as Mark Fisher wrote, it's easier to imagine the end of world, the end of the world than the end of this way of life. And many people can actually imagine more easily the total social collapse of the society we live in than they can imagine uh, an effective resistance movement emerging. And that to me is a sign of how much we have been disempowered by the society that we live in that teaches us that we are individual consumers who have very little power beyond submitting our public comments on destructive projects and then going back home. So I mentioned any means necessary. I think this underground role could be done nonviolently, but we would need to ramp up strategic, militant, disciplined nonviolence massively compared to what we have seen in the past, if this is going to work. Um, obviously what we've seen so far is nowhere near enough. We've seen huge expansions in fossil fuels, mining, extraction of all sorts. And, you know, concurrently we see this huge rise in population and consumption and so on. So is this a plan that is going to work? I don't know. Frankly, I'm not terribly optimistic. I understand what we're up against. I understand the scope of the society that is destroying the planet, the amount of power and momentum that is behind this. And I understand that we are all dependent on the system that is killing the planet. And yet, I think we have to try. I think we have to try. I look at this strategy, again, not as something that I come to with happiness, with joy, with any sense of glee. It's something that I see as an emergency measure to address an emergency situation. And in any movement, 
only a small percentage of people are actually going to be doing direct confrontation work on the front lines of whatever struggle is happening. Most people are going to be working behind the scenes to support that movement and participate in different ways that don't involve them being on the front lines. So these, <laughs> excuse me, these aren't going to be small changes. We're talking about revolutionary changes, transforming our society from top to bottom if we are going to have a chance to avoid some of the worst impacts of ecological collapse, a chance. Some of those consequences are already unavoidable, of course. We already know that. Ecological collapse is not a future scenario, it's ongoing. The mass extinction event has been ongoing for quite a long time at this point. We are deep within this process of collapse. And so there is a lot that we cannot change. The passenger pigeons are gone. The American chestnut is gone. Uh, but there are still bison, right? They could come back to the plains if they were allowed to. And there are still sage grouse. They could come back to the Great Basin if they were allowed to. So in Bright Green Lies, we wrote that Rachel Carson had to show almost religious dedication and extraordinary courage in order to do her work. And I think so do we. This is the work of our time, and it's the work that I've been focused on for the last 15 years through the organization Deep Green Resistance. We're trying to build an organized political resistance movement to defend our planet. And I'd like to invite you to join me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, now we begin the Q&A. And uh, Samrat is on deck, but I would first like to turn to, for the first question, uh, Bill Reese is online here, as Max mentioned. And he has uh, several comments, but some of them are posed as a question. So take it away, Bill. Well, thanks very much, Claude. Hi, Max. Really good to uh, see you after, I guess, some exchange a while ago. <clears throat> I made a number of comments, but the, the bottom line is this. I've been involved, as you have, for a very long time. In my case, over 55 years of, of fighting uh, the growth dynamic of our culture. And in that period, we've seen an enormous increase in the scientific evidence, in, in logical arguments, that the story you have told is exactly what's unfolding before us. And yet, we see continued increases in fossil fuel emissions. We see continued expansion of everything, including the mine site that, that you're concerned about. None of the just bare information, the knowledge that we seem to have developed has made the slightest difference in the trajectory of modern civilization. Many of our social science studies show that behavior change has to precede a shift in values, beliefs, and assumptions. Uh, most of us go the other way. We try to change people's way of being and thinking, it ain't gonna happen. I guess my argument is that there's just no evidence whatsoever that people will respond to new evidence that confounds or confronts their comfortable ways of being. We are naturally predisposed to growth and, and consumption. We've developed a, an economic myth that sustains that uh, natural belief. Uh, we've simply reached a point in history where what we are predisposed to doing, which used to be adaptive you know, in Paleolithic times, has become totally maladaptive today and will destroy us. So that to me is the dilemma. I agree with everything you've said. So we know exactly what we should do, what we should be doing, but we don't know how to get people actually to do it, to make the massive changes in lifestyles necessary to, to move this around, to change things around. And if we don't, I, I think there will be a massive die off of, of not only uh, other species, but of human beings well within this century. And literally billions of people are at risk because we simply cannot respond to our own higher intellect. Instead, we respond to instinct, emotion, and the very deeply ingrained sense of denial that we're on a wrong track. Sorry, I didn't mean to give you an essay, but I just love what you had to say. 
and uh, I'm caught in this horrible dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Bill. And thanks for all your decades of amazing work. I've really enjoyed reading your papers over the years and great to connect face to face uh, through Zoom here. Uh, I completely agree. Yeah, it's it is very a very very challenging situation what's interesting to me <laughs> is that anthropologically there are thousands of cultures throughout human history that have existed in more or less sustainable ways right and there are a lot of reasons for that you know those societies maybe didn't have access to huge amounts of surplus huge amounts of energy they were probably limited by natural factors like disease and different things right so that those many of those factors have disappeared essentially completely. Those limitations are gone. And we've seen the result of that. I, I think there's also, also a cultural element there. I believe that there's also a cultural element where societies can develop a story that's not built on growth. And but I, I think you're also right that as the evidence shows, we get that causality backwards, that our worldview often results from the structure of the society and the economic system and the environment that we're embedded in, not the other way around. We don't create the economy and the, the worldview and the culture based on our idealistic ways of thinking, that, uh, that it's the other way around. And you can see this in society today, like I'm trying to educate people around me and we've all been trying to educate people on these issues for so long but what are our efforts compared to Disney Plus and Hulu and ESPN and CNN and you know the endless stream of media that is produced by the dominant culture that just as a matter of course takes growth as a given like it just doesn't even question that it's not necessarily an active indoctrination process it's just the air people breathe. It's just the way things are, right? It's not questioned. Um, and that is one reason why I think that th if we are going to get through this in some way, if we are going to actually shift the course, then I think it's likely not going to be the result of a mass movement. That doesn't mean I don't think mass movements are important and or worth working for. I think they are. And even small groups of people can make significant shifts at times. But I think uh, we have to give up. Personally, I believe we have to give up on the idea of a mass transformation in consciousness. And instead, those of us who understand what's happening just have to do the damn work. And, uh, you know, that's challenging. Like I said, it doesn't, doesn't mean education's useless because I've been deeply influenced by various people throughout the decades who've shifted my course, right? It does... It does work in some cases, but if we're talking at a social scale, um, the evidence just isn't there that that's the path. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, both. And uh, Sucha, you are on deck, but now Samrat has the floor. Right. Uh, uh, thanks, Max. Amazing presentation. I spoke to you two years ago. So my question was that if you guys succeeded or were you defeated in the in the process of not letting the minds in? And the second question is then, based on that, where are you going next? And like, are you still uh, dedicated to, to this kind of resistance? Great question. <laughs> yeah, we were defeated. I mean, the land is being destroyed right now at a mass scale. Um, that's the most important. I'm really sorry to hear that. Yeah, 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 it sucks. It's really hard um, emotionally, yeah. um, but also, you know, I'm not. My body is not being crushed by a bulldozer right now, um, like the the sagebrush is, and the other beings who probably, literally, right now, it's a Wednesday, it's a work day, they're bulldozing whatever next piece of the habitat out there. Um, so, you know, that helps me keep going. <laughs> you know, the fact that. I here I am living in the United States with this huge amount of privilege, you know, almost all of which is provided to me by the natural world being destroyed in one way or another, growing up in a culture that's dependent on it. It's my responsibility to use that, um, to use that privilege in what ways I can, um, and to speak and to act. Um, and what comes next? 
it's a really good question. There's actually another lithium mine that's proposed for 15 miles, 20 kilometers or so, um, probably less than 15 miles north of Thacker Pass, just on the Oregon side of the border. Uh, it could be just as big as the Thacker Pass mine, if not bigger. And the region may be even more ecologically important. So I'm actually headed out there shortly to do some photography and video work and just to get on the ground and see what's happening there. Um, I just submitted a very lengthy public comment. <laughs> I say that after I was bashing public, making public comments earlier. But um, I'm sort of in all of the above when it comes to strategies. Like, I know the public comments aren't going to stop the mine, but I'm going to get the objections in the record because that might be useful for a lawsuit down the road. I also know that a lawsuit is unlikely to stop the mine, but if it can delay it for three years, maybe there'll be an economic collapse or something that will prevent the mine from happening in the long term. So, you know, a delay may be the only path toward the land surviving, right? So I'm going to do whatever I can, even if I know the, the underlying um, idea that there's sort of this democratic process around destroying this land um, is, not, is, is false, really. Um, you know, the agencies do sometimes reject, reject projects. Um, that does happen, certainly. Um, but the, the deck is very much stacked against us. Okay. I wish you luck. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to fight like hell and, uh, and take all the lessons that we learned in this one and try and apply them to the next one. And Absolutely. You know, yeah. part, of, part of my approach to all this work is that um, we try, we fight as best we can. And then if it doesn't work, it's making the case for me. You know, we I've been talking for years about why I think we need a, a, a truly revolutionary movement to defend the planet. Um, you know, that's sort of percolating out into the broader culture through, you know, films, how to blow up a pipeline, through um, books, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh uh, ministry for the future, you know, the, these sort of ideas are are percolating out that what we might think of as more extreme action in defense of the planet is probably quite morally justified, at least in some cases, um, yeah. given yeah. the extremity of the situation we find ourselves in. And uh, that's just becoming clearer by the day. Yeah, okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, Ted, you're on deck, and now Sucha has the floor. Okay, I guess my my question uh, uh, is a bit out of context. I feel most of our problems uh, drive down to the population. And unless we tackle population, you're going to get a get into this mess all the time and everything we do. And and look at Canada. Canada wants a bigger population. Uh, and so are the other countries. They use population as if they are the pawn or soldiers to dominate the world or economically or whatever. So unless we bring this message, look, population is going to destroy our planet. We got to do something to, that should be in every religion and uh, and whatever. Should be part of the KCOR as well, that we should be focusing more on one child or maximum two. And when I grew up in India, the population was 400 million. We had a place to play. Environment wasn't that bad. Look what's happening. And uh, most of the conflicts, you know, whether economics or others, are <clears throat> caused by population. Thank you, Sucha. Yeah, I completely agree. It's it's one of the main drivers. I mean, Overshoot by William Catton, I think, is one of the most important books ever written. You know, that should like th those type of things should be taught starting in kindergarten, you know, if not before. 
And instead, it's like this obscure academic text that I'm sure a lot of people on this call have read. But if we're looking at the population of Canada or the United States, I mean, it's probably a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent that have read the book or considered those ideas like population ecology ideas uh, seriously and have been really educated on those types of ideas. Um, it's shocking to me. It's like the level of negligence that is represented by the fact that basic population ecology is unknown, you know, nationally, that it's not discussed whatsoever. Um, that is an absolute travesty. And, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. I think it's really, really important. One of the, um, <laughs> of course, um, I'm sure you all are familiar with the, uh, the equation, right? Impact equals population times affluence times technology. And um, this is, um, I think it was Paul Ehrlich who said something like, um, considering only population or only consumption is like um, trying to say that a, a, the area of a square is, is just equal to one of its sides or something like that, right? It's that these uh, variables multiply each other. And um, so that's one of the points that we're trying to make at Thacker Pass, certainly not to distract from the population issue, but that's one of the points I've been making throughout the campaign on CNN and NPR and articles and all over the place is trying to talk about the link between overshoot, overpopulation, overconsumption, and the destruction of places like Thacker Pass is completely inextricable. It's the same problem. It's just different expressions of the, the same problem. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Thank you. Okay, Anitra, you're on deck and Ted has the floor. Yeah, it's really hard to argue with any of you because you're all so very correct. But our real issue is nobody's listening. And uh, I, I agree completely. The population and growth are uh, behind it all. And so is consumption. Our biggest issue is that the feedback loops that every other society has always had have been visible. And as you quite like, right, rightly said, uh, inputs that go into the new technologies aren't necessarily at the visible at the point of consumption. So the real problem is how do we in fact get the messages to people who do have to change their growth patterns, their consumption patterns, uh, essentially their reliance on things that as you have quite rightfully pointed out are far less effective than they believe. So my challenge, I'm a social scientist and I come directly at the, the notion that uh, it's got to it's got to be in their face. And I've got somebody else calling me. The CIA is on my case because I'm saying something they don't like. <laughs> hey, guys, we have the solution. We ain't telling you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we essentially have to find a more effective way to have the messages, the feedbacks from the system getting back to people. If you live in a small island, it's pretty visible. You probably know already, and you might even be doing something. Same in many small communities, same in many of the other communities that we've looked at, but it is certainly not universal anymore. And so my, I don't have an answer. I have a question, which is how on earth do we get the feedback me mechanisms in place that force people to reassess their behaviors? Yeah, I wish I had a magic bullet, but uh, my, my only answer to that is be relentless. Like we have to be freaking relentless in our approach to this work. You know, I think that we need to be getting in schools and on the media and in universities and mm -hmm. all throughout the culture, just hammering and hammering and hammering on this message over and over and over again and doing it in a way that is, you know, culturally sensitive to the audience that you're talking about. I think a lot of yeah. people make, make the mistake of sort of alienating people right off the bat when they're discussing topics mm -hmm. like this and feel like they have to be really blunt yeah. and just say the truth which I'm not saying the truth isn't important. I'm just saying like changing people's minds is a um, sensitive process 
and going about things in the wrong way can cause people to entrench in the opposite perspective. Mm -hmm. And I have well, a lot of personal experience with that myself. Yes, Max. Well, through success. the through the Club of Rome, we are actually trying to assemble success stories, which might at least be useful to instruct different behaviors. But we're just on that now. And if anybody wants to help, give us a call. But essentially, if we don't tell people what the positive solutions are, it's pretty hard to mobilize them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very well, much, Ted. Okay, Jean, you are on deck, and Anitra has the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for a pictorially beautiful and very sensitive description, particularly of the deserts. Um, I'm wondering whether you've gone through the strategic parts of your war against lithium and found out how many politicians and government regulators you would have to change to make the industry so that it could not move forward, at least in these very sensitive areas. And then the question is, would they just go elsewhere? And if they did, are there much better places to be? I've found solutions uh, to a wide array of uh, pollutants in the ocean for much of my life. And basically we found that if you go area by area, and you learn both the people and the politicians and the regulators that you have a much better chance than assaulting the entire industry. I mean, assaulting the whole petroleum industry or the whole of the tobacco industry is not as effective as going this area by that area by this area and picking off individual low-hanging fruit and 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 easy targets yeah absolutely thanks for that anitra that's a great question um first of all i would say that um our strategy has by been by no means perfect i think we made a lot of mistakes in the thacker pass campaign that <laughs> that hurt us not necessarily huge mistakes but oversights and so i would say to this group you know containing a lot of people who have a lot of experience broadly in the field of environment and overshoot in these issues. I'm definitely interested in looking, always looking for mentors and people to share accumulated knowledge and wisdom. Like I said, we're going into this, this next mind fight. And, um, you know, I'm only 35. So I feel like if I continue to do this for another 15 years, then maybe I'd have, uh, you know, accumulated enough wisdom and experience to really have solid strategy on a campaign like this. But of course, as this group knows, 15 years is a really long time with the pace of, of change that's happening on our planet right now. You know, we need to move quickly. Um, so we have done some of that work of trying to map out um, the regulators, the government officials, people have some decision-making power over these industries. And it's pretty challenging. Uh, the electric vehicle market is literally trillions of dollars. It's predicted, predicted to be trillions of dollars. So we're talking about um, the largest and most powerful moneyed interests on the planet um, investing heavily in this type of uh, mining and extraction, car production, and so on. Um, there's a lot of power behind it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, with this fight at Thacker Pass, I wasn't super op optimistic when I came in that we were going to be able to stop the mine because I had a clear-eyed understanding of the power systems at play, the dynamics at play, the momentum. Um, but we wanted to interrupt the narrative because one thing that I'm seeing is with the progress of the climate crisis, young people are increasingly radicalized. And we are seeing with the rise of more and more climate refugees, I think, like I said, I'm not a Marxist, but I think I'm, I believe in learning from all kinds of people, no matter their ideologies. And one thing that's interesting to me is this whole idea of a revolutionary class that comes out of Marxism. You know, this idea that back back in the day in 1800s Europe, it was like the downtrodden industrial workers 
represented the revolutionary class. They were the people who were directly affected by well, with the exploitation and had enough at stake that maybe they'd be willing to, to do some serious action, to sacrifice in one way or another, even if it was going to be a nonviolent revolution, but really to throw themselves into it. And with the climate crisis and the ecological crisis progressing, I think we're seeing the rise of a new environmental proletariat. We're going to see it grow bigger and bigger over coming years, which has the potential to be a revolutionary class that just didn't exist 20 years ago, at least not in sizable numbers. Um, and I see this rising radicalism among young people. So really, that was one of the core um, audiences for our Thacker Pass fight was to reach out to young, reach young people and help educate young people who are already grappling with global warming as a serious crisis, that electric vehicles and electrification are not this unicorns and rainbow solution that they've been made out to be, that there's this much broader issue of overshoot, that uh, the destruction of the planet goes a lot deeper than global warming, and that if we want to address these issues, we need to be thinking systemically. And, <laughs> and I think in some ways we did succeed in reaching that audience and beginning to shift some of the narrative and the dynamic and the the, the, the culture among uh, among those people. And I think that um, I think that that could bear some fruit in the future because I think, you know, Lenin was a pretty terrible guy in a lot of ways. I, I, again, I'm not a Marxist, but I try and learn from anyone. But one thing that Lenin said that I thought was so interesting when I heard this, he said, um, he said, there are, there are, uh, he said, revolution is not something that revolutionaries make happen. It's not like they they go out and do a revolution. Revolution is something that naturally occurs because of the processes that are playing out within a society. That there, these, these contradictions emerge, these fracture points emerge where there's so much tension that something's got to give, right? And in those moments, it is where people who are prepared can step in and take advantage to change the course of the future in some dramatic way. And that's what I'm seeing in the in 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 our near future, with the converging crises, is that these sort of revolutionary opportunities, these breaks, these fractures, are going to become uh, increasingly common and and more and more pervasive and powerful, and that we need to be prepared to take advantage of those to, uh, I think, help move our world in a better direction. And uh, you know, I won't pretend that I have by any means, all the answers on that, you know, this is where I'm at now is the result of me working on this for the last 15 years and my best, my best efforts at it, but it's certainly not comprehensive. Um, and, you know, we're talking about shifting a world of 8 billion people for now. And, uh, and, and that's going to take a lot of people working really hard and applying their intelligence to it. So that was a long and rambling answer to your very concise question, but hopefully it was useful. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank you. Um, I will apologize to both uh, Jean and Peter, and especially Peter. Uh, Jean, you are still on deck. And Peter, I'm sorry I skipped over you. Would you like to turn on your video and microphone and ask your question? Hi, this is Peter. I, I don't have a video. Um, my question is, was fairly basic. We have about 8 billion people on the planet right now. Uh, how do you perceive that these 8 billion people are to be provided for in terms of shelter, food, uh, and all the basics? Or do, you, or do you see a significant change in that number um, to towards the uh, 2030 date, which was often banding about sort of as the end of the world date? Um, how, how do you perceive that we provide for the people that exist right now? That's the basic question. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, Peter. Huge question. Um, incredibly important. Um, <laughs> I'm going to answer it indirectly at first and then very directly and head on. Um, when people advocate for nuclear power and, um, 
and talk about nuclear the whole issue of nuclear waste and long-term st storage of nuclear waste. Um, one of my responses is, you know, there's never been a plan to deal with it. The plan has always been like, kick it off to the future in one way or another. There was no plan. <laughs> there is no plan. Nobody has a plan. And that's the same way that I feel about this question is like, there is no plan. Um, obviously, the path that we're on right now is is leading towards, there was a recent paper, I think, that talked about the four horsemen of the climate change endgame. Um, it was talking about disease, um, conflict, uh, drought, and um, and starvation and food shortages. Um, and, you know, there are mainstream scientists saying that there could be 2 billion climate refugees within the next few decades, 2 billion. I mean, that's a complete breakdown of society globally, essentially. Um, that's catastrophic. That's the direction we're headed in right now with business as usual. Um, so <clears throat> like I said, I don't think that there is a, a great plan to deal with that. Um, you know, the, the, the best I've got is that we need like crash programs to address this in different ways. Um, <laughs> you know, we've seen governments start to declare things like climate emergencies. I know they did that in Germany recently. The problem, of course, is that a lot of this is being used. One of my friends is, is fighting wind energy development in Germany because the climate emergency declaration means that they've dissolved the environmental laws when it comes to protecting forests and so on. So they're cutting down this old biodiverse forest area near his, his home to try and build wind turbines on it, um, which to me just seems insane. Um, in a world of, of you know, Bitcoin and retractable stadium roofs and um, video game arcades and virtual reality and Google data centers and stuff. Like you're going to cut down a forest to run that. Um, you know, people have no recognition of the crisis we're in, obviously. Um, but, you know, I wish I had a better answer for you, Peter, but I think, you know, the best I can I can give is that I think that um, <laughs> some combination of, uh, of humane, uh, family planning programs to address the population growth issue, um, food relocalization programs. And I guess the, th am I allowed to swear on this program? Cause that's how I feel like I'm, that's, that's sure. where I feel like I'm at Go when ahead. I try and answer this program. Like the third leg of the tripod is we're fucked. And as you know, like a, a tripod with two legs is not is not stable. So, you know, there any population ecologist will tell you that when a population overshoots carrying capacity, there will be a correction. And that's not a polite thing to say. That's that's not something that I'm happy about at all. Like all the people I love are completely dependent on this system. And yet that's the reality. And nobody's talking about it. You know, this should be like debates on the front page of every newspaper in the world every single day. And instead it's crickets, you know? So um, I, I wish I had an answer for you, Peter, but I think like that's that addressing that problem could be the focus of, um, you know, hundreds of millions of people for the next 20 years and maybe we'll come up with something of a plan that would avoid the worst of it you know like i don't think there's any um answer beyond like a hell of a lot of work groundwork and grunt work and political work and community work and hope it makes a difference hope it reduces some of the suffering yeah, I, I thank you for your answer. I want to add one comment. You mentioned climate emergency. I live in Calgary. Uh, the city of Calgary has declared a climate emergency uh, with proposed spending 70 or $80 billion. And the very same people who are telling us we have a climate emergency with worsening fires and floods are committing a couple of billion dollars of taxpayer money to build 
an entertainment district, and a National Hockey League hockey rink on floodplain that flooded as recently as 2013. So there's the uh, conflicting messages, to put it politely, and yeah. uh, uh, get, get, gives us great, great difficulty. I do appreciate your uh, talk, and I uh, wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Art is on deck. We have about 10 more minutes, maybe nine. <clears throat> and uh, Jean has difficulties with her camera, so we'll hear her on her mic for her question. You have the floor, Jean. Thank you, Claude. Uh, Max, thank you for a very sobering and very realistic uh, uh, perspective on how things are going to be. And um, the, you, the last questions that you've answered are pretty good segues into what I'm thinking about in this, in this world as to what what could happen into the future. In the last few years, of course, everybody's well aware of the fact that we've had this pandemic and uh, the way in which our governments responded to it were immediate because all of a sudden it was a panic. We could do it. That's, that's exactly what we needed to do and they shut everything down. So it can be done. Yeah. The pushback has been pretty massive, but it can be done. We've had a slow moving crises for the last 30 years there are more people have been telling them this is going to be a problem this is going to be a problem but all of a sudden in the last couple of years especially the last few years we've had fires floods heat domes you name it and all of a sudden people are worldwide are waking up to this do you think the response that was done for the pandemic bad as it was in it as its implementation might be a model for what could end up happening when the climate crisis gets to the point when people are dying? Great question, Gene. I think it could be. And I think <laughs> I would like to think that the lessons would be learned from that. The, the, the fear that I have, which I think is more than realistic, it's already happening, is like the situation that I outlined in Germany. Um, you know, whenever I hear talk of um, streamlining Per, like permitting reform in Washington, D.C., um, a lot of the mainstream environmental groups that, you know, I may have friends who are in them or, or see their press releases and what have you, people are like, oh, this is great. You know, it's going to, they're going to reform these permitting processes to put in better environmental protections and so on. And I just have to kind of um, roll my eyes a little bit because I'm like, you know, this is often a euphemism for making it easier to mine or like shortening public comment periods and shortening review periods and reducing the burden of uh, you know environmental impact statements and so on for what good those have done to protect the planet um, so yeah i i think that um i see the the kernel of a positive response in the way that COVID was handled, like there, there could be a framework there that could be adapted to address these issues. Um, but I'm very scared and, and fearful and realistic, I would like to think about the idea that, um, you know, the influence of powerful institutions and, and industries on these sorts of, of government programs is huge. And, um, you know, the backlash to the declaration of the COVID emergencies justified in some cases. Um, you know, I can only imagine how people would respond if you try and take away their um, off-highway vehicles, you know, or their <laughs> their their Bitcoin facility that's run off the coal power plant, you know, or whatever it is. Like we. <laughs> These present very serious challenges. I don't think they're insurmountable, um, but I do see <laughs> like some of the um, some of the concerns that people have about the rise of ecofascism. A lot of that stuff is overblown, but I do see uh, where some of that concern is coming from for people. You know, I do think like individual freedoms are important, but I just don't think the individual freedom to destroy the planet for future generations exists. I don't think that's a real thing. Um, I think we're too focused on rights and not enough on responsibilities. And um, But nonetheless, we live in these cultures that are hyper-individualistic and hyper-focused on individual rights. And it's all about, you know, me, 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 and don't you dare tread on me. Um, 
So uh, there's a lot of risk with that type of, of top-down thing. And um, so I'm pretty skeptical. I'm pretty wary. You know, in a perfect world, I think it could be done really well. Um, and what I think what I think could potentially result in a, um, well, I don't know how to phrase this. What may be more realistic in my perspective is more of a regionally driven approach where certain bioregions, towns, cities, uh, counties, provinces begin to really take these issues seriously and perhaps form like you know, degrowth committees and create serious plans to address overpop, like create a, a 20, 50 year overpopulation plan, you know, that prioritizes human rights, but has very ambitious goals and, um, and start to implement that kind of thing at, at local and regional scales. Um, so I, I think there's likely a lot of balkanization in our future and, and, and violence. Um, but I see the potential there as well. Thank you. That was a very good answer. And uh, John, I believe there's time, depending on how long uh, you're on deck, John and Art, you have the floor for hopefully the next to the last question. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess um, uh, I, I've been struggling with the same issues that, that you've been talking about for some time as well. And and I constantly uh, I'm running up against this this wall of silence. My community, my my neighbors um, don't want to talk about this. It's uncomfortable. And and uh, uh, but yet at the same time, the question is, what can I do about it? I'm just one person and. And 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 I don't wield any influence. And and I say wrong. You do. Uh, what you should do is talk about it. It doesn't cost you any money, and it raises awareness. And hopefully, this can can uh, spread throughout society in a far better way than we're doing now, pointing the fingers at politicians and and industrialists. Um, uh, that's not working very well, and and uh, uh, I, I I have changed my my uh, my position on this and say talk about it, get out there. It's not going to cost you any money. So what do you what do you think of that as as one proposal to help move things forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important. I'm I'm going to share my screen actually real quick because I had one more slide, which was just some of the ways that I talk about it, <laughs> um, ways that people can get a hold of me. I have a newsletter and my contact information is on my website and that's that's our book. But I think that's really important. And um, this may be related to to John's question as well, which I saw in the in the chat. You know, I one of the things that I found in the, doing this work for 15 years is it can get really depressing at times. <laughs> it's incredibly serious stuff. Um, it, they're very somber topics. Um, you have to be very sober to face them. And I see, I see a lot of denial for, from people. I see a lot of people wanting to protect themselves from the emotional pain of grappling with the truth. And that to me is a very understandable human thing. I feel a lot more compassion for those people now than I used to, because this is hard stuff. Like this is really hard. We're talking about potentially pretty much everyone we know and love dying in really horrible ways because of choices made over generations and not potentially not having any power to do anything about that. And that is absolutely terrifying. Um, but one of the one of the responses that I have to that is um, you know, I'm I'm gonna live life too. Like I'm gonna enjoy beauty. I'm going to enjoy a good meal with friends. I'm gonna try and have fun in my life. You know, I'm the fact that we are in a crisis me, means that it's even more important to like find the joy where it can be 
to find the full emotional range and not just live all the time in a place of despair and despondency. Um, because, you know, the truth is like all of our ancestors have been through terrible things, you know, whether it, it my, my, some of my ancestors were driven out of, you know, Ukraine in the pogroms and there's genocides and there's wars and there's, you know, the, for the indigenous people on this continent, collapse isn't something in the future. Collapse was 500 years ago. Um, it's, it's, it's in a post-collapse phase now. And, um, and now there's going to be another collapse. Um, so a lot of people throughout human history and non-humans have been through some pretty apocalyptic situations. And I don't know what that will look like. I don't know what will come after. It could be the end of the human species even, even you know, and, um, you know, that's pretty grim. It's pretty hard to contemplate. And yet I'm alive right here, right now. And there's a beautiful white oak tree growing outside my cabin. And I love my nephews and I love playing with them and wrestling with them. And I'm going to have dinner with some friends tonight and just sit down together and enjoy a human conversation, human relationship. And then I'm going to go back to work tomorrow and I'm going to fight like hell to, to try and change the situation, you know? And, and that's what keeps me going and, and keeps me committed to it. I think is this idea that like, um, that life is really beautiful and that like the opportunity to be here and be alive and experience this and try and address a crisis like this um, is, is really an honor in some ways. Like it's an honor to have the opportunity to try and address a real situation like this. We don't live in boring times, you know? It's not like we're gonna live these meaningless lives where we don't have an opportunity to do something really important with our lives. We do have that opportunity and it's really hard and there are a lot of days when I'm just crying and depressed and really sad. And, um, and then I just try and keep going. That is such a beautiful summary. Um, and it was worth going over a couple minutes. John, did that satisfy or do you have a rebuttal comment to go? You are right, Claude. Uh, it's, he's answered both questions and I agree with you that it was a beautiful answer. All I'd like to do at this stage, is just to a little tiny twig of optimism on the floor. I just happen to know uh, Max, um, a member of the Canadian Senate, who is a background in economics and politics. Um, and I have been trying for 15 years to get him to pay some attention to global heating, which has been my issue for 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, we've had sufficient things that are obvious to a public figure in Canada that never were before. It's a very small twig of hope, but I offer it anyway. Thank you so much, John. And I think with that, we should turn to Jean for the official thank you from our uh, club president. Uh, thank Jean. you, Claude. And as I said earlier, Max, thank you for a very, very enlightening pro and sobering presentation that you gave us today. It is um, indeed my pleasure to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome and for taking the time to, to give this to us. You have beautiful photographs and now they will be preserved on the internet and YouTube, if you can get access to them um, for, for forever, if that's the way it goes. So thank you very much for that. And I look forward to, uh, to talking about this with other people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Real honor to be here. My pleasure. And for those who are still online, um, the, I would encourage you to go to our website, CanadianCorps.com. Um, on that particular website, you will see the link to this particular talk when it's available, as well as all of the other talks that we've had in our Zoom series and a few of the, the ones that are, were there before Zoom started. Um, also, the Stay Informed section, if you register for that, you will get access to um, new information that's coming on and things that are being posted to our website. Also, if you're interested in becoming a member of our association, 
you can go to our website and under membership, you will see uh, the fees as well as how to pay for those fees. That is, uh, in, um, for those, I'd encourage you to do that if you're interested as well as be, to become a member. And uh, also if you're interested in just donating so that you can um, continue to help us help people understand the problems that we're going to be facing in the future. So thank you very much for everybody for coming today and I look forward to more presentations again. Thank you. And thank you, Max.